Good morning and welcome to worship here at First Baptist Church of Pendleton. We are so glad that you are here with us for worship today, some in the sanctuary and some online. Welcome to worship. We have a lot going on today. At the conclusion of our worship service, we will have our quarterly church conference. Originally, we had planned to have a break for lunch in between, but with the high numbers of Omicron in our community, we didn't feel it was a good idea for us to take off our masks and eat in a large group. And so we're going to uh, abbreviate the service just a little bit and have a short break and then go into the church conference so that hopefully you won't be too late getting to lunch and, um, and we can be a little little bit safer that way. And so there's a couple things that are a little different in the service today. We will not have a time for children. Instead, the children will exit after the scripture reading. And so if children are watching from home, uh, we will miss having that time together today. But be sure to listen to the scripture reading about Jesus being at church and speaking at church or the synagogue as it was for him. And maybe you can draw a picture of that, of that story of what, Je of what Jesus was doing. Um, may we all engage in worship this day with our full hearts, with our spirits, as we come before our God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks that out of all the world, out of all the places, you have brought us here and now. We thank you, God, that you are with us always. We thank you for guiding our steps and guiding our hearts and we pray, God, that you would continue to lead and guide us to be the people, to be the community that you've called us to be. And we pray, God, that we might be a light so that others might see the hope we have in you. We pray, God, this day that we would hear good news for our hearts are hungry for good news. May we be attentive for that news. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The hymn says, I heard an old, an old, old story. 
And today we celebrate not only that we have heard that story, but that we get to share that story and indeed are part of the story of Jesus and his love. It's hymn number 627, Victory in Jesus. I invite you to stand and sing. Would you stand? Today's scripture reading comes from Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 21. I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, 
and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He, be he began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Jennifer asked me to give you all a brief synopsis of how we wound up, how we finished the year 2021 financially. Um, some of you may have seen the year-end financial statements and already know that we finished way beyond our expectations. And I think this congregation is to be congratulated and celebrated uh, because uh, at one point, uh, as Jennifer reminded me, our revenues, um, our expenditures exceeded our revenues by $60,000 uh, for the operating budget. Uh, in November, we had uh, that deficit had been had improved to thirty five thousand instead of sixty thousand. We were down thirty five thousand. Well, by the end of December, December the thirty first, we were down eight thousand. So, a good many people came through those last two months of the year, November and December, and because you gave. Uh, in previous years, we had enough reserves to take care of the 8,000 deficit. And then, you know, we have designated gifts, gifts that don't go toward the operating budget. And so I asked our financial secretary, Becky, if she would look through our designated and tell me what, how much money was donated in 2021 to designated gifts. And this was the surprising figure to me. The 8,000 was great, the 8,000 deficit that we could cover with reserves. But you, you gave $67,000 last year to designated funds. And I wanted to go over um, and tell you what some of those funds were. Of course, one was our building fund. You know, we had to repair a roof. We, I think, worked on or repaired some air conditioning. Um, and so some of that money went for that. But as you know, any, any amount of money that is uh, designated for our building, 10% of that goes into our hands-on missions fund. And so from that, we contributed to the Welcome House 
in Raleigh, North Carolina, which welcomed an Afghan family this year. We contributed to flood buckets that were then, as you know, carried down into Mississippi and I think Alabama, I'm not sure, for people who were um, affected by floods. Twice, we assisted uh, the elementary school in honoring teachers. We prepared a breakfast for the teachers one morning. And also, um, uh, we had the cake truck. They were honoring teachers as they left the school, and um, we provided cake for that. And then there were the missions offerings, the CBF global missions offerings that you, all, that you contributed to. There was Wayne's meat fund that we give to every year. Uh, this is meat that goes uh, to the Collins Children's Home. I think we collected $2,300, is that right? Um, toward that meat fund which Wayne and Cheryl buy at a good price and stock the free, their freezer with. Um, we contributed gifts to the MAGI program, which are for children uh, to receive gifts at Christmas that otherwise would not receive Christmas gifts. We contributed toward literature that was sent to uh, Joella Jimenez's uh, family to be used in her parents' church for children. Um, we contributed to the Barnett, um, the Barnetts, who are down in Immokalee, Florida, who are working among immigrants with food ministries. We contributed through CBF toward disaster relief in Haiti and also for um, Hurricane Ida. And there are other things. Um, that's just a list that I got from Jennifer. I said, Jennifer, can you help me think of all the things that we contributed to this year? Well, she was on the run and I was on the run. But that's what I came up with. But there's some other things that we left out, we're sure. But we just they just didn't come to our mind this morning. So in addition to giving toward our operating budget, you gave $67,000. Uh, and so our total giving was really outstanding. There are fewer of, our, of us, but we're doing more. And you're to be commended for that. So now let us pray for our offering. Faithful Father, thank you that you give the gift of abundant and eternal life. You have said that you are a good father who gives us good gifts. Your generosity overflows to us. Everything we have is a gift from you. As we bring our offerings to you, we give back to you from the abundant blessings you have given us. May our gifts be acceptable in your sight, O our God. Blessing and glory, wisdom and thanksgiving, honor and power and strength be unto you, our God, forever and ever. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
stand? serve a beautiful Savior, 
And thank you to our choir and Richard and Chris for leading us in worship through that beautiful music. I heard a story this week from rural Kentucky from February 1809. The story is that there was a rural mail carrier in the backwoods of Hardin County, Kentucky, and he came across a local citizen who asked him, what is happening out in the big world? We're so cut off back here in the backwoods that we know very little about what's happening out in the world. Of course, there were no televisions or internet or phones and very few newspapers. And so living in rural Kentucky, the citizens there had little access to information. And so the mail carrier said, well, we're having trouble with the crown again. We can't seem to get Great Britain off our backs. And there's talk of a national bank. And that will really affect everything, even for people way back here. Well, there's a lot going on in the big world out there. But what's going on back in these parts? And the local citizen said, well, shucks, mister. Nothing ever happens back here. Why would you even bother to ask? Well, there was a baby born last night to Nancy Hanks and Tom Lincoln. But shucks, mister, nothing ever happens back here. Well, of course, you recognize that name and that baby was Abraham Lincoln, who would in fact grow up to be quite influential and well known in the big world, well beyond the backwoods of Kentucky. Sometimes what seems unimportant or overlooked by most of the world just might make a difference in the world after all. The Gospels tell a story of a carpenter's son from the small town of Nazareth. And perhaps the people of Nazareth said, well, nothing ever happens back here. And then they heard Jesus, you know, Joseph's son, the carpenter's son. He started preaching and he's coming to Nazareth. He's going to be at the synagogue this Sabbath. Jesus has just started his ministry when he makes this visit to his hometown that we read about in Luke chapter 4. Maybe he wanted to go check on his mama. Maybe he wanted a home-cooked meal. Maybe he wanted to talk to some of his old teachers at the synagogue and bounce some ideas off of them. For whatever reason, one of Jesus' first stops on his preaching tour is his own hometown of Nazareth. We heard earlier Hayden read the text of Jesus' first recorded sermon from the prophet Isaiah. Jesus reads these words of hope and promise, words of good news for the poor, words of freedom for the oppressed and downtrodden. And then after reading these words, Jesus sits down to teach, as is the custom of his day. And he begins by saying, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Well, that's a pretty great sermon starter, pretty exciting. He reads these great words of hope and then says, it's happening right now. And it certainly catches their attention. Luke reports that everyone is amazed. In verse 22, we read, all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, is this not Joseph's son? A few nights ago at our Wednesday night Bible study, we were sharing prayer requests and someone mentioned the name of a teenager who grew up here in our church and someone else said, wait, they can't be a teenager, they're just a little kid. And I imagine that's what was happening at Nazareth. Some of those hearing Jesus at the synagogue that Sabbath must have said, that's Jesus, Joseph's son? He can't be 30. He was 12 just yesterday. Remember that time they went to Jerusalem and he got lost and they found him at the temple? I guess we always knew he was going to be a rabbi. I can't believe he's teaching in our synagogue today. They are amazed. Little Jesus has grown up and now he's full of wisdom, speaking words of grace and power. But then Jesus keeps going. He doesn't know to stop while he's ahead. He doesn't know to stop while everyone is amazed. And so he keeps going. Hear the rest of this story of this sermon, picking up in verse 23 of Luke chapter 4. 
Jesus said to them, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, doctor, cure yourself, and you will say, do here also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. Well, that escalated quickly. The mood in the synagogue goes from amazement to rage in just a few verses. This is a little bit like the emotional roller coaster we experience sometimes with sporting events. One moment, your team is doing great, and if you see the, the broadcast on TV, you'll see the fans cheering and shouting, and then a few minutes later, things take a turn, and you'll see them with their arms crossed and that sullen look on their face that the TV broadcasters like to show us. It changes quickly, and that's what happens here in Nazareth. One moment, they're amazed, eager to hear what Jesus has to say, and the next moment they are filled with rage, ready to hurl him off a cliff. The listeners of Jesus' sermon here in Nazareth seem to be bandwagon followers of Jesus. They're ready to jump on board when he's proclaiming good news for the poor and liberation for the oppressed because he's talking about them, right? They are poor. They are oppressed. He's talking about freedom for them. He's going to bring them power. He's going to bring them better opportunities. He's going to help them because they are the poor and oppressed that he is talking about bringing good news and freedom for. But Jesus keeps going. Jesus starts talking about other people as the recipients of God's blessing and miracles and redemption. And Jesus even starts talking about how sometimes those other people receive blessings that the people hearing at the synagogue themselves do not receive. Well, this no longer sounds like such good news to the hometown crowd in Nazareth. He's talking about God's blessing for their enemies, God's blessing for those other people, the foreigners. Jesus recounts two stories from the Hebrew scriptures, one from 1 Kings and one from 2 Kings. In the first story, a destitute widow and her son are saved from starvation by the prophet Elijah. And in the second story, an enemy commander is healed of leprosy. Now, neither of these two people who received these miracles from God are Israelites. Neither are part of the community of God's people. They are foreigners, strangers, Gentiles, other. And yet, Jesus says, they received a miracle from God. This good news about the year of the Lord's favor, this good news about freedom for the oppressed, it is not just for those who are already in. It is also for the other, for the outsider. And that does not always sound like good news to the insiders, but it is the good news that Jesus proclaims. At the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, in his first recorded sermon, Jesus already talks about including those who have been left out. And he does it even when the people don't want to hear it. It makes them angry. It makes them furious. Not only do they storm out of the synagogue, but they take Jesus with them, ready to throw him off the cliff. And yet, Jesus resists the temptation to tell them what they want to hear. He resists the temptation to maintain the status quo. He stirs up trouble and he gets himself in trouble, finding himself on a ledge with people who want to throw him off the cliff. On the cover of your bulletin this morning, you see a photograph of that cliff outside of Nazareth. 
This is one that I took in Israel a number of years ago after we toured Nazareth and then went up to this place where they have a, an overlook where you can imagine Jesus up on the edge of that cliff being threatened by those who heard his sermon and didn't like it because he was talking about good news for the oppressed, including other people beyond those who were already in, those who were there at the synagogue that day. Why does this make them so angry? Because he reminded them that God cares about everybody. And friends, if we want to be a community based on the teachings of Jesus, this is important. We too must believe and proclaim and live this good news, the good news that God cares about everybody. God cares for those who feel forgotten. God cares for those who, like the widow at Zarephath, do not know how they're going to feed their children tomorrow. God cares for those who, like Naaman, are suffering from a debilitating illness and are desperate for a cure. God cares even for those who do not know or do not follow God. God cares for those who want to follow God but have been told by God's followers that they are somehow not good enough. God cares for those who feel lost, broken, and alone. God cares for those who do not check all the boxes of what we think good Christians are supposed to do and be. God cares about everybody. This is the good news for the oppressed. This is the good news for the poor. This is the year of the Lord's favor. And the people don't like it because they are afraid that if God cares about everybody, then there's not enough for them. The fear is about scarcity, that there's not enough, that God's love is going to somehow run out because God's going to use it up on their enemies. But God's love is abundant. There is enough of God's love and grace for all of us. So we do not have to hoard it, but we can celebrate that God cares about everybody. That is the core of this good news that Jesus is proclaiming. And in a few minutes at our church conference, one of the things on the agenda is that we'll have the opportunity to consider adding an inclusion statement to our church covenant. We've been talking about this for a number of months now, and it has not come without tension because it's hard to admit that sometimes we are tempted to limit God. And we do this because we're human. We are limited by our own experiences and understanding. But the message behind the inclusion statement that we will consider today is simple. God cares about everybody. That's what we're trying to proclaim. And this statement is meant to remind us to look for and to recognize God's image in our neighbors, in all of our neighbors, because Jesus said that God's grace and God's miracles are even for the widow of Zarephath, or even for the Syrian commander. They are for everybody. Many of you have heard the proposed inclusion statement already, and it will be in your conference packet a little later, but I want to share it with you now and invite you to hear it in light of the scripture that we've heard today, in light of the words that Jesus proclaimed, because this is what the inclusion statement is meant to embody. Jesus proclaimed good news for the poor, freedom for the oppressed, the year of the Lord's favor. And as we have contemplated how we might live that out, this is the statement that we have come up with and are presenting to the church. We are a community of believers in the one true living God who is manifested as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We strive to welcome all people to join us on our faith journey. Our desire is to embody the inclusive ministry of Jesus Christ, recognizing that all people are created in the image of God and that church attendance, participation, membership, and leadership are open to all without regard to race, ethnicity, gender, mental or physical ability, sexual orientation, education, economic circumstances, marital or family status, or any other distinctions of society. We endeavor to be a welcoming and affirming 
community of grace for all people, loving our neighbors because God first loved us. Friends, God cares about everybody. That is the message that I hope we want to proclaim to our community and to the world because this is the good news that Jesus proclaimed even when they did not want to hear it. And it is still good news for us today. And so may we have the courage and grace to look beyond our own experiences and to imagine how might God be working in the world and how might God be working through us to bring about this good news that Jesus proclaimed, the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus read, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then Jesus said, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Friends, how can we make this true for us? How might we fulfill this scripture in our hearing as Jesus proclaimed? How might we be a part of the fulfilling of this good news? What can we do to bring this good news to the poor, to bring freedom for prisoners, to bring recovery of sight for the blind? How might God be calling us, First Baptist Church of Pendleton in 2022, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. May that be our response today, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, not just for ourselves, but for others, for those who just may need a miracle even more than we do. Because indeed, God cares about everybody. Let us pray. God, for your abundant grace, we give you thanks. We know that we do not deserve your grace, for we are flawed and we fall short. And yet, God, out of your great generosity, you have poured out forgiveness and grace and mercy and love. God, we pray that we might accept these gifts. We pray that we might accept your forgiveness. And we pray, God, that we might extend this same grace to others. God, may we recognize your image and your love and your work in people who are very different from us. May we recognize that even in different experiences and different expressions, you, God, are being proclaimed. For you are a big God expansive enough to cover all the earth. You are not limited by anything. And there is enough grace for all of us, even for us, even for our enemies. And so may we accept and proclaim and live the year of your favor, Lord God. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our hymn of response this morning invites us to sing our commitment to Christ. Will you come and follow me? Hymn number 473. As we sing, I'll be here at the altar table. I would welcome the opportunity to hear from you. If you'd like to come and share a decision to be a part of this church or to, join, to, to partner with this church in different ways, uh, to do something that God is calling you to do. Perhaps you're watching online and you'd like to make a response. I would welcome the opportunity to hear from you as well during the week or even in the comments. This is an opportunity for us to respond as God leads. Will you come and follow me? Hymn 473.
Let me invite you to be seated for just a moment. As I mentioned earlier, following our postlude, we'll take a brief break so that we can set up Zoom for our church conference and our choir can take off the robes and and we can settle in for our church conference. Um, The church conference packets are available in the hallway, so we'll bring those in as well. So if you need to take a quick break and come back, uh, we will do that shortly. If you're joining us online, the Facebook broadcast will end. Let me invite you to go to our church website, fbcpendleton.org, where you will find a link to Zoom, where you can join the church conference on Zoom. That will be a little bit more interactive so that you church members can vote and you can ask questions and we can uh, interact that way for our church conference. Let me also mention our Wednesday night Bible study will continue this week. We will not have uh, a meal this Wednesday night, but we will have Bible study and children and youth activities. Let me also remind you to stop by the prayer garden if you haven't already to see the Yellow Heart Memorial. It is only there for a few more days and then it will be moving on. Uh, So let me encourage you to stop by and see that. Are there any other announcements we need to mention? Um, We will have more at church conference. So let me invite you to hear this word of benediction. Depart now in the fellowship of God the Father, remembering as you go By the goodness of God, you have been brought into this world. By the love of God, you have been kept all the day long. And by the grace of God, fully revealed in the face of Jesus, you are being redeemed. Amen.